Mm-hmm. Just play it in G, Jana. Yeah, if you like. Okay. Oh. When I'm tossed on life's sea and the waves cover me and the dark cloud they won't let the sun shine through there's a voice that seems to say child there'll be a brighter day don't allow the storms to hide sweet heaven's view cause you got one more valley one more hill maybe one more trial one more tear one more curve in life's road Maybe one more mile to go You can lay down your heavy load When you get home Don't let Satan see your tears Learn to smile through those tears Hold your head up high and give the world a smile Just be faithful all the way It'll be worth it all someday For it's all gonna be over after a while You've got one more valley, one more hill. Maybe one more trial, one more tear. In life's road, maybe one more mile to go. As we walk this road of life, Jesus guides both day and night, and He wants us all to have a joy within. There are mountains we can climb, and we never shall decline for we'll rise up to meet him in the air you have one more valley one more hill maybe one more trial one more tear One more curve in life's road Maybe one more mile to go You can lay down your heavy load When you get home Cause you've got
testimony? In your time, you make all things beautiful. In your time, Lord, my life to in your 
teaching me your way that you do just what you say in your time in your time in your This morning, um, there's a, a word that keeps coming to me, and it's anchored. And if, if there was ever a time that we need a, to be anchored, it's today. You know, in the natural, every ship should have an anchor. And depending where you throw that anchor, if that anchor is thrown into sand, chances are that anchor is not going to haul when the winds are blowing. But if that anchor is upon that solid rock, it's going to hold. If that anchor is leaning upon man, man's wisdom, it ain't going to hold. That anchor has to be upon that solid rock. It has to be upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So this song come to me and I'm going to try... <clears throat> <clears throat> Number 237 in the red book. <clears throat> Upon life's bounds And where mighty billows roll I fix my hope in Jesus Bless anchored of my soul when trials fears assail me as storms are gathering old, I rest upon His mercy and trust Him more. I've anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll brave. I've anchored in Jesus, I fear no wind nor wave. I've anchored in Jesus, for He has power to save. I've anchored to the rock, 
But she's hurting on the inside It's getting hard Just living anymore And the shadow she has clung to Painful things she has been through Have left her 
feeling worth the storm. But you change worthless sin to precious, guilty to forgiven, hungry and dissatisfied, empty and to full, and all the lies are shattered. And we believe we matter when you change broken into beautiful. We live with accusations, sometimes heavy expectations that tell us we can never measure up. And yet you repeat with mercy, and in your eyes we are worthy, till at last we see how much we are loved. As you change worthless into precious, guilty to forgiven, hungry and dissatisfied. Empty into full, and all the lies are shattered. And we believe we matter when you change broken into beautiful. We live with accusations, sometimes heavy expectations that tell us. We can never measure up, and yet you repeat with mercy, and in your eyes we are worthy. Till at last we see how much we are loved, 'cause you change worthless into precious. Guilty to forgiven, hungry and dissatisfied, empty and to full, and all the lies are shattered. And we believe we matter when you change broken into beautiful. You make worthless. Guilty to forgiven, hungry and dissatisfied, empty and to full, and all the lies are shattered. And we believe we matter when you change broken into beautiful.
views that treasure, and in many cases it's bowing to it. Yeah. And surrendering. Seek the Lord. Yeah. Don't surrender yes. to this world. There's a man's ways or ideas. Seek the Lord because you don't need nobody else. Amen. Jesus is the one who saves. Amen. 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 change your order of the service now. Heavenly Father, we come before thy throne of grace at this time. Lord, that we look into your word, Lord, guide this vessel of clay as you would see fit. We ask it now in that precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Surely the Lord is, is wonderful in the hour that we live in. If you've been born again and, and if the Spirit of God got a hold of you, the child of God likes to live on something that's alive in their day that God is doing. And not just all the things of our day, sometimes we get to see things of God's record of long, history of long, long ago. And it was our anniversary, so we went for a, for a ride down to Parsborough. And there's a museum there that shows uh, 
dinosaurs, uh, all different kind of dinosaurs from the largest to the very smallest. Uh, apparently, one of the fellow that was at the uh, museum that found a lot of fossils. As a young man, he wanted to work in the shipbuilding with his uh, father and he fell through a floor and he, he injured himself and he couldn't walk right or work right after that. So he went out on the shores and yes, maybe a lot of people is not familiar with the, the Bay of Fundy. <clears throat> the tide rises 40 feet. Here to the ceiling is what, maybe 20? So 40 feet is quite a bit of a difference. And uh, so as we, on our journey, as we travel in that area, some nice sights and that's all fine. But while we're in the museum, they had in there the records of the last ice age. It started around 19,000 years ago when the ice god brought this planet to a halt, to a deep freeze, because he was going to do away with the prehistoric animals and so forth, and he was eventually going to bring man on the scene. And they said from 19,000 years ago, that's when it started, and it started melting, and they believe it's around 12, 12 and a half uh, thousand years, that, years ago that the ice melted. But when we read in Genesis, as we have learned, when the earth without void and so forth was in darkness, that means the earth was covered with ice, not maybe every little last place, but they was predominantly covered with ice. And we see, when you read Genesis, it seems like my... God created the earth, heavens and the earth in six days. That's nonsense. First of all, man, to educated man today, looks at the word day and he thinks 24 hours. But the word day doesn't mean 24 hours. It's just what we're accustomed to measuring time. Day only meant a cycle. When you start, let's say, from the morning... Go, you go to the afternoon, the evening, and back to the morning again. And so that would be a day. But when God's talking about restoring the planet as he brought it in the deep freeze, so well, let's, say, let's say if it is around 12, 12 and a half, I'm not going to argue that point. But every day that God talks about in Genesis, there are a thousand years apiece. And so... If you look at it in the right perspective, from 12 and a half or to from, from, let's say, 13 minus uh, 7 days, it gives you about the right time that God would have to take to restore this planet to bring it back. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, Moses didn't have a geological degree. But God wrote it in such simple terms that man could understand. How did God put the earth in a deep freeze? He just had to move the planet away from the sun and it froze. Then he just had to bring it back and it took 6,000 years to bring it back in its place. After he's done that, now the planet's restored. And what you read in Genesis is just a cause and effect of God moving the planet a little closer because water, ice will melt, water appears, water evaporates, then you can see through the sky, land appears, the earth... And everything grows from there on. So praise the Lord. So, this is something that Lord has got us to understand for some now some 30, 40 years. But there's still some church that believes that God created it in six days. Something's gone awry somewhere. Looking at the evidence... And looking at the evidence, they'll deny everything in order to prove that the Bible, the way they see the Bible, is right. And how is that in today's, that we live today? The same thing applies in the hour that we live in. But the hour we live in, we're living at the time, this is going to be wrapping up. The Lord is coming to a place where he himself is going to come down and catch a bride away. Now, in 
We were looking I know it might be new to our sister here because I don't know where she uh, Celeste met her in what in Toronto so I just I just had this sermon here prepared for this morning because we were talking about we're going to go into Revelation chapter 10. Uh, just to break it down a little bit. In Thessalonians, it talks about the Lord shall descend with a shout. And if the intellectual mind will read that, like some churches, oh, Jesus is going to come down and make a, an actual shout one day. Now, the shout is a message. And the Lord would come in a message. Yes, because while well, he wants somebody to read something or hear something, God has a purpose for it. He was going to bring something in his word to prepare a people for a rapture. Because had it just been the things he preached when he was here on earth and the gospels and the epistles of the apostles, that should have done the job a long time ago, shouldn't it? But it hasn't. There's a lot of things in the Word of God that has not been revealed. It's been written, but not actually revealed. And so, when we look at... Well, maybe I could put that scripture out. So this scripture had been sitting in the Apostle Paul that that sent this to the Ephesian church. Way back in 60 AD, that's quite a while back, or in that early church. Yet, there was some in it, information in it, to console some of the souls that had died that they that somewhere in time that they would be in the resurrection as well. So not to get nervous because they were expecting the Lord to come in their day. But Paul says the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. In other words, he's going to be coming from glory, from the the spirit realm. And that shout then following his shout would be the voice of an archangel. And this is not just an ordinary angel. When God uses an archangel, it's something dynamic and important. And last of all, with the trump of God. Now, the trump of God, as we see in the scripture, God's going to allow Jesus to sound that trump. It says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we that are alive remaining shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. But for you and I to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, God had to precede his coming in a shout. And what does that shout? It's, it's, oh, he screamed something. No, he's screaming a message. Where would the shout begin? How would we ever recognize that God was do, going to do something? Well, when we look at in the days when Jesus walked on earth, his disciple came to him and says, now, the Pharisee says that, that uh, John the Baptist didn't restore everything. He was supposed to be that Elijah was supposed, was supposed to restore everything. Well, Jesus points and tells him, yes, John the Baptist was that Elijah. But he says, the Elijah shall come again future and restore all things. Now, there would be a, an anointing that was on John the Baptist. John the Baptist forerun, Jesus' first coming. There would be an anointing on a prophet before his second coming coming. Now the reason he would anoint a prophet before his second coming because when we talk about that shout, that's how God would initiate that part where now he would start to speak to the earth. And we know that God sent a prophet in our day. Now, when you talk about a prophet, everybody gets nervous. Well, who is he? Is he your denomination? He didn't come out of any denomination. Just like John the Baptist didn't come out of the Pharisees and Sadducees and all those. But God will raise him up. And it's not because a man says, hey, I'm a prophet. If the works and the thing described in the Bible, the man don't do, he's not a prophet. I don't care what he claims to be. 
Most of the time when men like that rise up, it sounds good for a little while just to fall flat and it goes nowhere. But God did send a prophet. And in 1963, it is God through an anointing opened things in the book of Revelation to let us know where we were in time. He opened six seals in 1963. And the reason God had to wait till 1963 because what was contained in those seals, although John the, the, John the Revelator received it in 96 A.D., uh, what's in, what was written in 96 A.D., yes, some things pertain to that period of time. But the majority of the things he wrote concerning those seals, what, have to, what was pertaining, what would happen through the whole grace age of time, and so, therefore, to be meaningful to understand what those seals meant, history had to be somewhere on ground. So, in 1963, when God ordained a man to open those up, it, how beautiful it felt. Because it, 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 it showed the exact picture where man has been and what has happened during the Grace Age. Because we can look back, it's history. Yes, there's some things in the book of Revelation for future. But nevertheless, and this is all comprised in what we call the shout. But then, in the hour that we live in, God started, started with a prophet. But according to Ephesians, there should be a fivefold ministry. It's not the prophet that's going to perfect the church, it would be a fivefold ministry. Ephesians chapter 4. And so therefore, that's why God has to send a message. Because right now, in the religious world, well, there's, when you talk about a, an apostle, oh, that's a missionary. An apostle was just not a missionary. Yes, in the early church, the gospel had to be spread. But he's the man that God held the plumb line on the word. An apostle had the same uh, office work as what an Old Testament prophet had. They held their word in their day, God would have an apostle for this hour. And so God slowly, after 1963, started bringing things on ground, teaching the bride, bringing her back into the Bible, not just the men's creeds in different churches. The churches in the world will not save you. It's in Jesus Christ that you and I are saved. All right? And so, yes, God brought in that shout, God initiated through a prophet. Then he started raising up an apostolic ministry to further on the revelation that's in this Bible. And it's one thing to have a revelation like uh, Billy Graham, the four horse rider. It went up for a little while and it fell to pieces. But the prophet that God used, what he brought, still stands 100% today. Then an apostle started break, breaking the things in the scriptures. Because most of the things that men would read in the, in the different religious realm, it was just, well, it's fable, nice thoughts. But what God had written in his word was more than just fables and nice thoughts. They were meant for certain things in the hour that we live in. Because that's where when we looked at last week concerning Luke, the 12th chapter. And in Luke. The 12th chapter talks about. Now remember, we talked about Thessalonians, how the Lord was coming to shout. It's not when he was here on earth, but it would be somewhere at the end time. The seals would have to be revealed. John, the, a, pro, a prophetic ministry would have to happen at the end time. But then in even Jesus' own word, he's talking about here in 36, You self are like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return for the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, that he, they may open up to him, in your own leisure time. Immediately. Why? Why is there an immediate concern? 
when the Lord would come and return. Now, from the wedding, it's the wedding preparation. He comes and knocks where? On men's heart. He wants them to open immediately. Is it immediately for salvation? No. This is concerning. He's going to be feeding not baby food, but he's going to be serving meat. That's going to be needful to know where the bride, she knows where she's at and how close we are coming to the Lord's coming. And so we are to open, and the true believer will open up to him immediately. Intellectual believers, they don't. Well, we got to examine it. If most of the group accept it, that's fine, we'll accept it too. That shows the difference between the two spirits in the world. One's religious, the other one's the believer. It says, blessed are those servants when he finds them watching. Watching for what? To be saved? No, watching for his coming. So the Lord's going to be coming. There's a lot of things that God has opened up in this hour that we can see concerning his coming. And he says, Verily I say to you, he shall gird himself. Now, when he talks about girding himself, when you look at Ephesians, I uh, believe around 6th chapter, when, when even ourselves, when we it's talked about that the man of God should be girded with truth. So he came girded with truth. And makes him that sit down to meet. Now, he didn't bring a steak, a pork chop, or any of those things there. This would be deep things of the word of God. And will come forth and serve them. Now, Jesus never left the throne of God. He's still on that throne of mercy. But he will come in a revelation. Did not Jesus come to Paul on the road to Damascus? Jesus had already died, had been to glory. And now Paul is persecuting the Christians. And he's knocked to the ground. And Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. He says, It's hard for you to kick against the prick. Was it actually Jesus there? Now, if you read just that part alone, it sounds like Jesus came off the mercy seat and went and talked to Paul way back there in the early church, uh, as the early church was starting. But Paul himself says this. In Acts chapter 26, it was a vision. Through a vision, Jesus spoke to the Apostle Paul. He didn't leave the, the seat. So if that, if we can see that connection, that God can, Jesus can send his word in a form of a vision or speak to someone without leaving the throne because he can't leave the throne of mercy till the last one has come in. And so now he's, he's done that to Paul. And Paul knew it was a vision. So he made them to sit down to meet and come forth and serve them. And he shall come in, and it says, and if he shall come in a second watch and a third watch. Now, in years gone by, oh, second watch, third watch, oh, that's the watch of the day. The hour of the day. That's not what Jesus was talking about. There would be three periods of time. There would be three watches. That Now the Lord would build up more truth and understanding in each one of the watches till man gets to the place that he would be ready when the Lord would actually come. So when he says, what about if I come in a second watch or a third or the third one? Blessed are those servants. Now, he was feeding, sir, he was feeding meat to who? Servants. Why? Because he's, the servants are necessary to be fed because he's going to raise up a ministry for a fivefold ministry that's going to bring the bride to perfection. Right? Well, praise the Lord. And so therefore, when we look at from 1963, when God's Open six seals. Now you would think, you know, as you read the Bible in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, when Jesus opens the seals, it sounds like he's opened them all one after the other. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's how our natural carnal mind would read it. But you have to put a picture together 
that he did not open seven of them in a row. He opened six. Because had he opened the seventh one in 1963, then we could say, Lord, this whole book has not been revealed. So what's wrong? You said it was, everything was going to be restored. So it would take from 1963, and we'd be gone down the road 55 years. So in the meantime, he's come down to feed, get a people ready, get some servants ready. Now, not all servants are going to be true servants. There's going to be terror servants as well. They're going to be listening and hearing the same thing. But God's going to test them in each one of those watches to see if they're going to walk on with further light with the leading of the Holy Ghost or whether they're leading with their intellectual or Satan has blinded them. And so, therefore, as time would go on, is we are now in this third watch. We're in the time of that fivefold ministry. That fivefold ministry, there was, the service had been, yes, it started with a prophet in 63, but he only lived a short time. But there was an apostolic ministry that was on ground that opened up a whole lot of things in the Word of God that is ever so clear, so easy to be seen. That was to prepare a ministry now. And that was feeding them. They, they heard what they needed to have inside them for their function when the time comes when he's going to put them to work. But we're living in the third watch where he's going to be putting them to work. To work. And some of the very ones that have been sitting among the bride are the ones that the citizens hated him. They rebel against what God's doing in their day. They did it in the first watch. They rebelled against the man that God had on the scene in the first watch. They rebelled against the one in the second watch, and they're going to do the same thing, rebel in this third watch as well. Now, I know it's not the direction that I thought it'd go this morning, but just to, to break things down a little bit. We are in this time frame here. Ahead of us, there's going to be a sequence of events That's going to show how close we're getting to the Lord's coming. One other thing is there's going to be a miraculous war where God is going to put Israel in her full land as it was promised to Abraham in Genesis. The temple is going to be built. Then there's going to be a major war, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And that war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, or the war, the war now one brother says, well, it's the war in 39, yes. But you have to comprise the whole thing together for the whole picture. So in 39, in that war, when that's over, that's about the time that we've been instructed when that seventh seal is going to be broken. Not before. Because here to then, there's still some things God has to open up in his word that we need to see. It's been only the last year and a half or two years that the bride has come to understanding there's been three watches. It meant something. It's just not Jesus said that, well, it was, well maybe i got to say something to them and so he can fill in the time so they can write something down. There's a, there'll be a second watch and a third watch. Now, he meant it for a purpose. And the watch is watching concerning things concerning his coming. And if we don't have watching in each one of those watches, wherever we may be, and we neglect it, then... You're, in, you're going to be in for a big surprise. Because I'd have to say, if you been, haven't been watching, you will not be in that rapture. There's a... Uh, I was just listening to a, a TV program, a religious program, and they were talking about Israel... In Deuteron don't have to turn to it. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, God told Moses to tell the people, The Lord your God will rise up a prophet from amongst you, the Jews, like unto your brethren, as he be of the Jewish race. 
And to him you shall hearken. In other words, you should, you're going to have to listen to him. Now Moses in the Jewish realm, he's the major prophet of all prophets to them. And it goes on to say, And I will raise up a prophet among your brethren, like unto thee, that will put my word, I will put my word in his mouth, and he shall speak them all the things that I command him to speak. Now that alone would have been somebody could have said, well, who's that going to be and so forth. But we find in the book of Acts, chapter 3, at around verse 22. Here, speaking like this, says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, a prophet, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you a brethren, your brethren, like unto me, and him shall ye hear, and all things, whatever ye say, he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass. Now here's a warning. And it shall come to pass, which will not, those that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Now, who is that prophet? That's the Lord. It goes on. It's, we know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't hear him, then they'll be cut off. Oh, but Gentile minds can go, oh, well, we believe what Jesus said when he walked on earth. We got the four Gospels. Is that the only thing that Jesus ever spoke? What about in the book of Acts? He spoke to Paul. Yes, that was not concerning Revelation. It was to stop Paul what he was doing. And God was arresting him to use him. But Paul was used to bring mighty revelations on ground. And therefore, those that would not listen to Paul... Because Paul got it from the Lord. And those who don't listen to the Lord would be cut off spiritually. Yes, no more fresh revelation came after 96 AD. But when God started opening up in 1963, those seals, all the religious world, realm, denominations, independent, whatever case may be, that refused to... Believe what Jesus brought on ground in 1963 are cut off in time. God gives an opportunity for them to hear, to change, to, to look what they're doing in their day. They weren't cut off because what he spoke, because of what Jesus spoke when he was here on earth. They were cut off because of God, what Jesus was speaking, what the Lord was speaking, I should say, because all revelation that the Father, the revelation of Jesus Christ is all that the Father has given him, and he in turn sends it down to the earth. So now, as that prophet would speak, those that didn't hear the, hear, after a space of time, they were cut off. Then the Lord didn't just stop with a prophet, then he brought an apostle on the scene. And those that wouldn't hear the apostle, they too, even though they were of the Branham line, would be cut off. Because the whole thing lies under what it says in the book of Acts. That will not hear him, not hear him of the past. Those that was, that was facing God's word, fresh word on ground in the past, they were dealt with. But God is always looking at the generation in which the word of God is coming down on. And they, if they refuse, then in time, God cuts them off. So he allows Satan to bring them into a realm wherever they want to go. So, it goes hand in hand. With what we see in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25, it says, 
See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not, they refuse him that spake on earth. That's when Jesus was on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him from speaking from heaven. He just didn't speak from heaven back there. He's been speaking from heaven since 1963. And refusing him that speaks from heaven is refusing the word that's fresh on ground in your day and your time. And that's where we're living at now. Now, I know I was going to mention... Oh, yeah, I've got time, I guess. We're going to be looking at Now, there's a lot of things God has revealed in this hour, and it would take weeks to go through the whole thing, but um, for for the sake of the people here and those listening by the Internet. When that seventh seal is broke, we see it when it's broke in Revelation chapter 8. There was a silence in heaven for a half hour. Man has... Try to figure out what the half hour is. It's dual in purpose. After Jesus breaks it in heaven, everybody hushes up because now, what's he going to do? Because the hour has arrived. He's opened that last seal. Everybody knows when he opens that last seal, that book of redemption is going to be open. But they only keep quiet for about the space of whatever half hour is in heaven, 30 minutes or whatever time frame if you want to look at it that way. But the half, silence in heaven for a half hour, we can also look at what says in Revelation chapter 17 that the beast will have power with the, uh, the ten horns will have power with the beast for one hour. Now one hour is not 60 minutes, it's seven years. And so when we look at when there was silence in heaven for a half hour, yes, there's a physical silence in heaven where they're hushed up because they're going to scream loud in heaven and and honor Jesus. But that half hour means from the throne of mercy where Jesus was sitting on, no more revelation is coming to the earth from glory when that seventh seal is broke. It's all has to do with the angel that's coming down to the living bride here on earth. And when that seventh seal is actually broken, and now we're in Revelation chapter 10. And I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was about his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as, uh, as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. In other words, it shows that Jesus had opened the seventh seal. The book of redemption is open. He set his foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth. In other words, it's showing a universal picture. It's not because he's going to, he didn't find the, the Atlantic Ocean and put one foot there and one foot on the land. It's just shown universally. And then it says here, And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried seven thunders, other their voices, plural. Now this angel is going to cry a loud voice. When is he going to cry that loud voice? When he first comes to the earth. What is that loud voice? Can we look at something, let's say, in the scripture that we can see a parallel to what that loud voice would be? Now, it talks about 
It says, when he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And I'm sure most of our, the minds of those that are listening this morning, well, that's Jesus. Is it? Find me a scripture where Jesus roars like a lion. But I'll show you scriptures that God roars like a lion. And if you want to mark it down, in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 12, it says, The king's wrath is as the roar of a lion. Who's that? That's in the Old Testament. That's Jehovah himself. But his favor is as the dew on the grass. We can look at also in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord, Spoke unto me, like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey. God spoke as if it's a lion roaring on his prey. And when the multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, and when he will not be afraid of their voices, nor abase himself for the noise of them, for the Lord of hosts shall come down and fight for Mount Zion. Now that's, yes, that things took place there, but we're, we can parallel this coming here up in the future as well. As the bird flies, so will the Lord defend Jerusalem. And defending it, he will also deliver it, and passing over it, he will preserve it. Turn ye unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. It's in the time there was rebellion so the Lord screamed with a loud voice like a lion that's Jehovah He's, it's pictured in the Old Testament that's when Jerusalem the inhabitants was revolting against God in this hour there's a lot that's revolting against what God's doing in this hour In Amos, the third chapter, verse 3. Can two walk together except they agree? Oh my, that's that's for sure. (laughs) Will a lion roar in the forest? And when he has no prey, will will a young lion cry out of his den if he's taken nothing? Now there's, it's, it's more or less a metaphor saying, well what, Will a lion roar if there's nothing there? In other words, a lion doesn't roar for nothing. He'll roar because he sees a prey. Right? Because there's something is going about to happen. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where there is no gin or there is no net? Shall one be taken in the snares from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Surely the Lord God does nothing but he reveals his secret Unto his service the prophet. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? There's a time that's coming. And the Lord has spoken. But who can but prophesy? Now. Using those as a scripture as a base. We know that Jehovah can now speak. Like a lion, when it wants to. We look at in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 to verse 9. And if we go there for a moment. In the 17th chapter, this is where Jesus brings Peter, James, and John to a high mountain, to Mount Transfiguration. It's going to be set as a type. Because when he brings them up there, 
All it says, okay, in verse 1. After six days, Jesus taken Peter, James, and John into, and his brother and bring them up to a high mountain apart. They were, he only brought them. Why? All right. Just leave that for a moment. And he was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as, as the light. Now, when he was transformed before them, picture yourself. Here's Jesus with his three disciples. And it says he's transformed. The physical Lord Jesus Christ that was there didn't change one hair, one iota. It was a vision of the eyes of his disciples that are now seeing this event. God's bringing this out for a purpose. And then when he sees, in, they're caught in a vision as they see Jesus being transformed before them, it would be a futuristic picture of what Jesus would be like. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. They had been dead hundreds of years before, 600 or more. But it is a vision. So God using those Image of those two character to be with Jesus, speaking with Jesus. Yes, this picture here, Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah portrays uh, certain things that you want to look at. Yes, pr prior in the days that Jesus is going to be transformed, coming in, in that manner, he's also, also there are going to be two anointings of Moses and Elijah in the future on two prophets going to be sent to Israel. It was pointing to the end time. But they were there to console Jesus before he was going to leave the earth. Because what his ministry has now come to a close, he was about to leave the earth. Now when we bring into Revelation chapter 10, when the bride sees that angelic being, we are about ready to leave this earth also. Because the great station has now been ended. And so therefore it's portraying a somewhat of a parallel of what was happening in the days of Jesus. But here's something else I want you to know. I'm still in Matthew chapter 17. Then answered Peter and said unto, and said unto the Lord Jesus, as to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So they were thinking in the natural terms. But here, watch what happens. While he yet spake, while they were talking, behold, a bright cloud came and overshadowed them. What does that cloud represent? God Almighty himself. And a voice, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Oh, that, that was nice. There's more to it than hearing that he is the Son of God, that it is nice to hear, to know that, God, that Jehovah, or the great eternal spirit, has now confirming this. But watch the impact it has on them. And when his disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. They weren't afraid when they see Jesus being transformed. Nor when Moses was talking or Elijah was talking. But when that cloud came and it spoke, it caused such an, in, an impression, in, uh, an effect on them that they became scared. Why? Wouldn't that constitute a loud voice that would cause someone to shake, to fear? Now when we come to the book of Revelation, chapter 10, and we can turn there now.
And I saw a mighty angel come down from heaven. Over the cloud. This is just a summary. A rainbow about his head. His face as it were the sun. And his feet as a pillar of fire. These are all being attributes of God Almighty and Jesus being now given to that angel to be portrayed that way. That angel is not going to come and appear to you and I, hey, I'm the angel. But he's going to bring a vision to you and I who Jesus is. And it's not Jesus that's going to be speaking like a lion. It's going to be the voice of God of that cloud that speaks with a loud voice that all the hearers, well, this was nice to hear. There'll be a lot of people trembling, some because that Spirit of God will be there. It's coming with that angel. And he will speak in the same manner that as he spoke when the disciples when on Mount Transfiguration, if you want to look at the type, if we're going to look at Moses and Elijah being with Jesus, and we're looking here at the end time, that God's going to not bring Moses and Elijah, but He's going to bring two men that's related to the bride, because that back there it was for Jesus. Here it's concerning for the bride, and so therefore God will use a prophet and an apostle, and that will be nice to see as well. But then when that loud voice speaks... I believe it will have the same effect as what happened to those disciples in that day. When he did speak, they feared. Did, they, did not the people that came out of Egypt, when Moses went on Mount, Transfigur- on the, on Mount Hermon, when God was speaking on there, they feared. They trembled. They didn't want, Moses, you go speak to him. We don't, we don't want to go up there. Because there's something about the presence of God when He speaks in that manner. It's loud. As a lion. Yes, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when He does come, and He speaks, has that sword, and He speaks, yes, He will speak in that manner at that time. But it is the voice behind it. It is God. Authority being pushed through. How many can see what, what we're looking at? Because just to say, well, the angel's coming. We know he's going to project the image of Jesus Christ to you and I. And that's, he's going to say, he's going to speak a little louder saying, this is Jesus. No, out of that cloud, he's going to speak something. That's where the loud voice is going to be coming from. Because if we see it in the type in, in Matthew chapter 17, that's why in Revelation chapter 10, that's going to be an a ominous, important time. Will there be any questions? Asking the Lord, well, do you think this, it's, the real vision is happening? you think this is... No. Just like it caught the disciples... When they heard it. Because there had to be something that. Because they had heard that voice before. When he was being. Not all the disciples. But when he went to be baptized. A voice came out from heaven. And spoke then. They didn't fall on the ground and. Was scared. But on Mount Transfiguration. They, it was a different situation. And I can see that being a parallel to the time in that seventh seal. So that voice of the archangel. And how is Jesus coming when he does come? In a vision. Now remember, the literal Lord Jesus does not come when that seventh seal is broke to you and I in in his resurrected body. It is a vision that is given to you and I to the bride of that hour. And what if that same angel 
We know that same angel when he de- when the bride is gone, and then to the Jews, he brings a vision of Jesus with a nail scarred hand in his in his hands. It is the same angel. Why don't, why couldn't he bring that to you and I? Here in Revelation chapter ten. Now remember, when you're in a vision, as this as if it's really the, real. A dream is different. You got things here and there, but a vision is is like you would be awake and seeing it. And so, therefore, Jesus is going to be made revealed through us through that angelic being. Like I said last Sunday, if you are trying to somehow sneak in that that an angel is Christ in some form, then. When the rapture takes place, don't plan to go to the wedding supper. Go to Israel, because that's where he's going. We're going to meet Jesus in the air and go up in glory with him. But once that vision is, is taken, and now that we hear that voice out of that cloud, that speaks loud, we see the vision of Christ. That the angel brings to the bride at that hour. The next step is the seven. Th- that's when the seven thunders are now going to sound. Now, if the thunders, one thunder, brought forth six seals that shook the religious world in 1963, you would think that those seven th- thunders would be louder than that loud voice, but they're not, because it's loud to the bride. The seven thunders is going to be uh, something that's it's not written, but is to complete that bride before she get ready. Now, once she has been completed in the revelatory understanding with those seven thunders, whatever they are, then we come before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember in second in second uh, Timothy uh, chapter four verse one. Paul says, I charge you, Timothy, that concerning the resurrection, that Jesus is going to deal with the quick and the dead. At his appearing, not at his rapture. It's different. Because we meet him in the air. He don't appear. The world don't see him there. But the living bride will see him appear in a vision form. Here in Revelation chapter 10 and what we've been speaking about. Then he's going to judge the quick, which is the bride here on earth. And that's why while we're here on earth, the living element is judged. Yes, it is that angel projecting everything that Christ is, he wants to say to the bride. And that bride is going to be judged that They are the quick that are here on earth. But in heaven, the actual Lord Jesus Christ, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ, is judging all the deceased saints in glory. That's why he don't come when that seventh seal is broke. When that seventh seal is broke, He's busy with all the millions of deceased bride saints. That's why he sends an angel down here to you and I. Now to you and I, would you recognize him if he actually came himself? What would be the difference seeing him in the vision form or in in actuality? Well, that's why that angel comes and he has everything that the bride needs in a prophetic manner, because that's why there's silence in heaven. It's the angel that now instructs through how God and the Lord Jesus Christ has instructed the angel when he sends him down concerning what he needs to do, and then the quick, that's when we are going to receive our judgment. The judgment is not whether you're saved or not, it's your reward, how faithfully we walk with the Lord. That's what that judgment is about. And remember, that judgment is at the time of his appearing, 
not at the time of meeting him in the air. And he doesn't appear at the wedding supper. He goes to the wedding supper. We go to the wedding supper. So where are you going to put that judgment? These things God has been opening up in the last while. I had an email this week. A couple of them, actually. Here's one of them. He says, A lot of us has of young believers are tired of the milk of the word and it seems that we all re- that's all we're getting now from the present day ministry that came out of Brother Jackson. I've been looking for someone to preach more, even just a little bit. And he says, thank you for your sermons. I watch all of them and post them on my Facebook group every Sunday. So there's young people that are hungry. They're not going to stand stand for the same old rigmarole of preaching things of the past. They have their place. And it's needful when there's young, there's things that need to be addressed or things to be brought up because we can't always go live in, 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 in prophecy. But there's a hunger out there among the young people. They want fresh food. Not burnt over food over and over and over again. If this was to go another 10, 20 years, that's all you'd hear from some of them. Now, I don't want to read the other email because it depicts a certain church and others what they've been doing. I'll post it up in the back. So, brothers and sisters, yes, this is the hour. The bride lives on fresh meat. The revelation Brother Branham brought, those six seals, they're meat, but they're not fresh meat today. Of course, if a believer comes in and he's never heard them, to him it would be a fresh meat. But to the movement, as far as God's bride is concerned, it is no longer fresh meat. Neither is the things of Brother Jackson. Oh, well, we can bring some things out of Brother Jackson. But they never venture any further than 2005. Why? Does not the Holy Ghost speak to them to show their hour? They have more confidence of things of the past and numbers. If you're looking for numbers, I'd have to say, look what happened to David when he numbered the people. Did it go well for David? There's no security in number. There's only security in the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, Amos talks about that there would be a famine in the land. Not because of the shortage of natural food. And if we're talking about a famine, it's a famine for the Word of God. And if you're famished for the Word of God, that means you have to hunger for God's Word. And if it's just the Word that you're looking at that the the people in the world is famished for, or the bride is famished for, hey, a lot of it's been revealed a long time. It's not hidden. A lot of churches preach the basic salvation. That's not where the famine is. The, the, the famine is for the fresh word of God. That's why the eagles will go wherever it is being brought. Yes, the church will goes here and there and all those things. And they have programs and whatnot. That's not the hunger that really that Amos is talking about. Out there in the religious world, they just want the hunger to keep the devil off their back and, and hope they're going to heaven. But the true child of God, he's hungry for the fresh word that is on ground in his day. And if we refuse to hear him that speaketh, what happens? 
That's what's hanging over the, over the time period that we're living in now. You can't say anything. They can't change their mind because Satan has got them convinced that they're on the right road. That they've got all the truth that's needed. Oh, we're waiting. Yes, God will show some. But it's been 14 years. What about the next 10 years? And if you have truth, that's fresh truth, why don't you preach it? Well, times fleet by. I was going to go and bring in a whole lot of other things, but I sort of just took parts of things that the Lord laid on my heart concerning this hour. But what I want to, one thing I did want to relate was what happened in Matthew chapter 17, the Mount Transfiguration. It's a parallel of what's going to happen in that seven seals broke. And if that voice that spoke out of the cloud caused those three disciples to fear, can't you see that's that loud voice when that comes? That roars like a lion? And we see in Scripture that, that God, the great eternal spirit, can roar like a lion. It didn't say in Matthew chapter 17 that the voice that came out of the cloud roared like a lion, but it had the same effect as when a lion roars. What happens to a, a prey that hears a lion roar? He fears and trembles, doesn't he? That's what happened to those disciples. So read between the line here. So when the Lord spoke in Matthew chapter 17, it was as if a lion was... It came with such an anointing and force, if you want to, that it causes them to fear. Now, it's not using the same words in Matthew chapter 17 as what you see in Revelation chapter 10 verse 3. But when he roared, that voice, that loud voice that roars, got to be something. Do we know all the details? No. Do I know everything? No. Oh, well, we're not allowed to go to look at it till God actually gets someone to, to bring it all find out. God opens up a picture and he gets more details as we go along. Of all the things that we've seen, Luke chapter 12 and Luke chapter 19 belongs to the end time. If you're trying to put those parables in the days of Jesus, then I have to say you've been cut off. It don't belong to that period of time. It says when he was returned. And because it says return, well, first thing we have in our mind, oh, here he comes physically, we can see him. No, he can return in a message. When he returns for the bride to capture up, to bring her out and to meet him in the air, the world's not going to see him. And there too, oh, what, there's going to be the rapture one day, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And sometime our mind fantasizes, oh, I can walk up to Jesus and say hello. Now remember, all the bride sings from the grace age. They're in the millions. The bride that will be living on the earth, it's going to be in the thousands. Or I don't know what the numbers will be of the living element. Is everybody going to get around Jesus if there's 10 million? Are you his favorite? No. It doesn't speak that you're going to go up and say, Oh, thank you, Lord. When we go up in the rapture, you meet him in the spirit world where he will be waiting for us. Sometimes our Gentile mind can go read things that's not there. All right, that's enough. You can, let's just stand at this time. Lord, I realize that we went through a lot of things, but I just pray, Lord, you take the words that were spoken and put it together to those that hear, Lord.
And Lord, I ask at this time, give you thanks, Lord, for, the, for what you have done for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I, I went over time again, so maybe at this time I'll say we'll be dismissed at this time too as well. So Lord, bless you until uh, the evening service.